everyone. Welcome to Coast Connections. I'm Elizabeth Hines, and today we're coming to you from the Sinamu First Nation here on British Columbia, whose west coast, Nanaimo, BC. We've got a really, really interesting program for you. In fact, we're doing it in two parts today because there's two different adventures we're going to be looking at. Our guest today um, circumnavigated the world in his sailboat. Not only that, he did it solo, alone. Not only that, he didn't use GPS, he used only celestial navigation. And if that wasn't enough, he did not get off the boat for nine months. Um, we have a remarkable program for you today. Please welcome Mr. Bert Turhart, all the way from Gabriola Island. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, currently the, uh, the uh, terrifying 20 minute ferry ride from Gabriola to Nanaimo. So, exactly. Liz, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today. A pleasure to have you here. Bert, after nine months at sea, not mm -hmm. stepping on land, how long did it take for you to get your land legs back? Uh, it takes about a month. A month. It, it takes about a month to get your land legs back. And it, take, it took me about four almost five months to get to normal sleeping patterns again. So, uh, wow. so I took a long time to, to reacclimatize. Mm -hmm. Now, Bert, um, we'll put up the map of the, of your route in just a second mm -hmm. here, but what inspired you to do this? What was drawing you to see? Well, there's, um, there's, there's many, there's many reasons why. So I guess the, the, the simplest one is to say something about myself. And that is, I like to do things that are really hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of sailing, this is the hardest thing that you can do, is to sail solo, nonstop around the world in the Southern Ocean, the most extreme environment on the planet, bar none, using only celestial navigation. So very few people have done it. Um, very few, meaning you're the only North American <laughs> yeah. who's ever done it yes, in I'm, North America or South America. I'm the first North American. You're the first yeah, one to do, to do it. it. And so, only the ninth person in the world. And the ninth, yeah, I mean, congratulations. That is an epic achievement, Bert. Yes, That's, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're here to tell the tale. So um, <laughs> the, I like to do things that are hard. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been drawn to do things that are hard. Um, and I have a real bent for um, uh, history. Mm -hmm. So to the coast of the west coast of British Columbia, the west coast of North America actually, is just absolutely imbued with this amazing history that has to do with cartography and geography and exploring. And my father was a land surveyor. so. I have a sort of a natural uh, inclination to map making. And uh, there was a very specific short period of time when almost all of the world was charted and mapped. And I wanted to somehow recreate the experiences that those early navigators and explorers had. Mm. And uh, of course, they're seafaring because they came from far away to this coast. So there I am in a sailboat. I figured I wanted to go to the, I want to go to the places that they went. So uh, it wasn't just a circumnavigation, but I've sailed up to the Bering Sea, out to the Aleutian Islands, following in the wakes of Cook and Bly in Vancouver, La Perouse, Quadra de, uh, de, Bay, uh, de Bodega, the list goes on and on. So it was a natural extension of my explorations along the, 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 the coast of British Columbia and up into Alaska and Aleutian Islands to go around the world um, through the, passing underneath all the, uh, all the five caves. The five caves, as you say. And I just want to let our viewers know, too, that, Bert, you're retired from the Canadian Forces um, yes. military, and yeah. you're also an oceanographer. Yes. You, yes. Yes. And an entrepreneur. You've done all yes. kinds of various <laughs> things. So you yes. had um, really mad skills to, mm. to be doing this type mm. of uh, circumnavigation. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to put up the map here and show our viewers mm -hmm. the map of the world here. Okay. And the five capes. Just take us... Um, you left Victoria, and what did you do? Okay, so you leave uh, um, to sail nonstop around the world. Of course, you can't go through the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal. You've, you've, uh, that would be cheating. Well, cheating, <laughs> yeah. So, so um, you have to go beneath. Uh, you have to go into the Southern Ocean. So you go from Victoria all the way to the bottom of South America and, and get around Cape Horn. Um, that is the Cape. That is the that is the epitome. Um, it's the it's the touchstone for every for every sailor basically. Um, because anybody who's ever sailed around the world, starting, starting, you know, with, uh, um, well, of course, Cook and Bly and, and those guys, but Magellan, uh, Magellan and, and uh, well, the list yeah. could, goes on. They have to get around Cape Horn. Mm -hmm. So passing underneath Cape Horn is a bit of a passage of rights. So there, there's actually a Cape Horner Society. So I'm a member. So, so, you get, so Victoria, bottom of South America, bottom of South America, across the South Atlantic to the bottom of Africa, and that's uh, uh, Cape Agulhas across the southern you know, Indian Ocean to the bottom of Australia, which is um, um, Cape Lewin, which is um, the west coast of Australia. And then it's um, Southeast Cape, which is underneath Tasmania, and then South Cape uh, under New Zealand, mm -hmm. and then back to Victoria. And how many kilometers was that in total? 
Um, or it's, nautical miles. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I went um, just under 29,000 nautical miles. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, multiply that by 1.8. So say two, it's like 60,000 kilometers and change. Right. It's a very long way. <laughs> it's a very long way. way, yeah. Without stopping to for provisions, you did not reprovision your boat. There was one interesting yes. thing we'll get to in, yeah. in a second here, but yeah. um, I, that in itself is, uh, I mean, you weren't stopping in Hawaii to get banana no. <laughs> or no, breadfruit. I, That's what Captain Cook got. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I, I, uh, it's one of the one of the one of the serious mistakes I made was that I didn't I didn't bring enough food. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out. Uh, I knew how many calories I, I, I would be burning. So uh, you, you burned approximately six to 7,000 calories a day in the mm -hmm. Southern Ocean. But I was doing way more work than that. So I started running out of uh, food uh, almost right away. I realized I was running out of food right away. So mm -hmm. almost immediately I was rationing food. And at one point I was down to 800 calories a day. Wow, what um, would that consist of? What would you have? <laughs> 800 <laughs> calories today. What does well, that it, look like? It looks like, it looks like a little bit of rice, a little bit of mayonnaise. And every now and then a granola bar. That's what that looks like. Wow. Until and for how many days was that? Like weeks, uh, months? Uh, that was, I was doing that for close to a month. Wow. Uh, and uh, I was running into, I mean, that, that creates issues in, 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 in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But um, when... And the rigors of sailing, mm -hmm. that takes a lot of stamina. Yeah. And that is very, very difficult. And you're not a man in your 30s, Bert. Do you mind no. telling viewers how old you were when you did this? Uh, I, I left when I was 61. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. I left amazing. when I was 61. Let's meet C. Bourbon, your okay. beautiful vessel here. Okay. Tell us a little bit about her. She was built in Hamilton, 1987. Yeah, she, yeah built in Hamilton, 1987, by a Canadian designer named uh, Pierre Meunier. Mm -hmm. It's really a Reliance 44 hull that was uh, um, uh, modified a little bit by uh, Hank Hinckley, which is a very famous um, boat builder and designer out of, out, of, out of the United States. He and his brother had a falling out. Hank came to Canada. They built one of these boats, mine, and then he and his brother got back together again, and he went back to the United States. So there's only one of these boats around. It's wow. actually uh, the Reliance 44 is a very traditional boat. It has uh, it doesn't look like the uh, if you went to buy a boat today, it wouldn't look anything at all like Suburban. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing about Suburban is that it's unbelievably forgiving. So it's very very kind. Um, it's slow by today's standards um, because uh, well just just by the just some of the physical design characteristics, but be. Um, being slow is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's very hard to be fast and do what I did because I, you mentioned I was becalmed for 50 days. So that, yes. that can put a dent in the, you know, the, the average yeah. speed, but what was your average speed overall? Like a, a, a fast walk? A about a fast walk. A fast yeah, walk. Just, so. just over, it's about 4.5 nautical miles, okay. 4.5 knots, which is, mm -hmm. uh, again, multiply by 1.8. So it's, it's basically a, 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 a quick walk. Yeah. But and you this can, is all under sail. There's no, you're not no. using any fuel here, which uh, you would have had to make landfall in order. Well, to I did. Get I used a little bit of fuel to charge the batteries. Correct. So you need a little yeah. bit of, you know, fuel to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's all under sail. So it's a, it's a 24/7 proposition. Mm -hmm. I got asked when I was away, you know, what do I do at night? You know, yes. what do I do in my, what, what do, do, do I do in my sleep? spare time? <laughs> there is no such thing. So yeah. I actually sent him my, I sent that 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 person my my daily schedule, mm -hmm. which started at five in the morning and ended wow. at three. Wow. So um, if, on a good day, I could get all those things done. Wow. So, so Bert, you're not steering your sea no. bourbon the whole way. You said no. about only about six or eight hours of the whole journey were you actually yeah. steering. Yeah. So tell us about the weather vane. Yeah. Or the wind vane, pardon me, yeah. that's connected to the rudder. Well, it, the, it, the wind vane is actually, it, it's what makes this kind of voyaging possible. And there was the, 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 the principle, the servo pendulum principle was, was invented by a guy that, by the name of Blondie Hassler, who was the, the first commanding officer that I think of the special boat service in the in the UK so uh, he's an amazing individual actually this guy if you get a chance you should read you should you should read about people could read about what what he's done he he actually but I, I know we're short for time but so I, I won't talk anymore about Blondie has to, but he invented the thing so basically it takes a it takes it takes a signal from the wind so if I want to go this way to steer towards you yes. the wind might be over here Correct. I, there's a vane that you can turn, and I turn it into the wind like this. And when it tilts back and forth, depending as the boat moves, it steers something underneath the boat. So this tilts, this makes something in the water go like this, and the pressure of the water is what actually steers the boat. Because height, you know, the water is very powerful, as you can imagine. Yeah. So I just align the boat with the wind, okay. and the wind vane does the rest. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's unbelievably robust. It steers better than, than better than I could ever steer. So I, I can steer the boat for about 20 minutes better than the wind vane. Wow. And then after that, you're too tired. Mm -hmm. Like there's times when 
you cannot possibly steer the boat for more than 10 or 20 minutes because of the concentration that's required. And uh, it's so furious, and the, boat on the, the motion of the boat is so extreme that you, and it's pitch black, you lose all reference as to where you're going. Yeah. You can't sit there and stare at the compass the whole way because wow. of uh, because of the demands of actually steering you know, over the wave, this wave, you know, around this breaking crest, whatever the case might be. Yeah. And you had some rough, rough, rough seas. Oh yeah, like the very, very rough. Yeah, the weather is the weather is unbelievably yeah. bad. Tell so. us about <laughs> the two times yeah. that your mast, yes. your fifty foot mast, yes. was underwater. Yes, as was eighty percent of your boat. Yeah. And you were swimming yes. alongside your boat at night. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. So, so how yeah. How did that happen? And how did how did it upright? Like, how well, did you survive that? Well, but I, before I left, I I I fully expected the boat to be inverted, completely upside down. You did. Yeah, fully wow. expected the boat to be inverted. So your your job as captain is to keep the water on one side <laughs> yes. of the boat and not the other. Yeah. So I did everything humanly possible to make sure that if the boat turned upside down, that it would it would remain mostly watertight, mm -hmm. mostly watertight. Yeah. So um, and then of course, even just sailing the boat when the waves are so large that the boat itself is mostly underwater. So during the times when it's just really the weather's bad and stormy, the boat itself is mostly underwater. So a wave crest will come over and just completely inundate the boat. Or um, you know, you could be f screaming down the face of a wave. And um, the the wave itself just just inundates the boat. Just just the boat tends to squat. Waves tend to you know collapse and crash. So um, so the boat is and then spray and foam. The list goes. There's a hundred ways for the boat to get underwater. So the idea is to keep the boat mostly waterproof. So the boat's going to invert or come close to it, but then come back up again. It's designed to come back up. To yeah. So one of the reasons of the the older designs like I have, like Suburban, they're very robust that way. Mm -hmm. They can they can they can heal over you know, before and still come back. Yeah. There's a range of positive stability and, and my boat tends to have a very robust range of positive stability. Wow. So, and it happens very quickly. It happens literally in the snap of a finger. Um, it's hard to imagine. Were you sleeping at the time? No, no, no. I was okay. I was outside. Yeah, like, um, and you were attached to your sailboat, obviously. Yes. Um, even though you're swimming alongside it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you have to be very careful about how you actually attach yourself to the boat because yeah. there's lots of people who've been uh, well, I should, well, without being well, too too grim. So yeah. you, I was very careful about how I was attached to the boat, fully mm -hmm. expecting to be in that situation. And it happens fast enough that you, it's only afterwards can you sort of piece together, you know, how it actually happened. Right. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, wow. it's novel. <laughs> it's novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, novel. Now, I just want to backtrack a little bit and just um, t as an oceanographer, what exactly is a cape and what makes them so treacherous? to um, navigate, but just want to give viewers an appreciation sure. of what you're facing there, these well, there's, capes. There's, there's capes all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's Point Atkinson, which is literally a cape. Basically, a cape is just a, a piece of land jutting out into the ocean. And the five great capes happen to be um, the bottom, basically, of five continents, as it were, except for New Zealand and, and Tasmania. But they're, they're great big pieces of land that jut out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And, they're, and they tend, these capes tend to be mountainous. So what you have is, in the case of, we'll talk about um, Cape Horn, you have the Pacific on one side and the Atlantic on the other. So you, you literally have two oceans colliding. Mm -hmm. You have, um, in the case of Cape Horn again, you have these massive westerly winds that are sort of butting up against the Andes Mountains. And then of course that creates all kinds of turbulence in the atmosphere. You have these the, the west wind drift, which is the major ocean current going around uh, Antarctica. That's actually butting up into the shallows that extend you know, um, past Cape Horn. So you have, yes. you have all these things happening at once. So so. Um, these the Great Capes um, are again the bottom of the continents, as it were. But but they they're pieces of land that jut out into the ocean, and because they're sticking out into the ocean, they're disrupting everything that's that's happening around right. them. The currents, you know, in the water and in the air, uh, the major weather systems that are actually following the currents and the atmospheric, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like the jet stream and atmospheric rivers. So you have this massive disturbance, and anytime you disturb something, of course. Nothing, yeah. nothing good happens of it. It's like, yeah. yeah. So plus that, the ocean depth really changes yes. there, don't they? At, yeah, at capes yeah. And that that is three thousand feet to, or yeah. Um, yeah. The the average ocean depth is four thousand meters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our, in in the case again of of Cape Horn, it goes from from basically four thousand meters to three hundred feet. Yeah. So you take all wow. this, you take this giant body of water and try to jam it over top of this little shallow shelf, and uh, the waves, of course, 
the ocean itself becomes chaotic, literally chaotic. So wow. um, there's there's that takes mad sailing skills as a sailor to, to be able to navigate that by yourself. I mean, that's that's <laughs> incredible. Um, uh, well, you weren't actually alone because you got no. Salty McPorpus was yeah, your, yeah. your mascot. He's like 42 years old and he came yeah. on this voyage with you. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about, Bert, how did you deal with the solitude mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, by yourself for nine months? Mm -hmm. um, and how did that affect you, like, um, your, your, like spiritually mm -hmm. and mentally? How mm -hmm. did you deal with that solitude? And you sort of became one with the elements. Yes. You're out there with the waves, the wind, mm -hmm. the air. How was that for you? Uh, that's a, such a unique experience. <laughs> Nobody really has this yeah, for I nine think, months. I, I think that, um, well, firstly, there's being alone mm -hmm. and lonely are two vastly different things. Yes. So you can be, um, you can feel very lonely watching a Canucks game surrounded by 20,000 people, none of whom really seem to care about you very much. <laughs> that's lonely. Yeah. But being alone is something entirely else. It's, it's something entirely different. So uh, sailing, um, because it's it it it's you you have to work so hard. There's lots to do. So there's never you know you never get a chance to sit down and really um, ruminate about you know how lonely you might be. So there's lots to do. So you're 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 occupied. But one of the things that's uh, one of the things that you're able to do, or I'm able to do, and I, I, everyone, sh I shouldn't say just me, it's everyone, is that you have to bring your entire being to bear on the task. So that's your, 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 mental, your, your mental self, your emotional self, your spiritual self, your rational self, your physical self. And all these, all these aspects of you, um, when you can align them, you become something um, that you cannot possibly imagine. Your, your capabilities are, are almost limitless. So, and it's very easy, um, in that kind of environment where most of life gets stripped or sloughed away for you to sort of align yourself. Mm -hmm. And once you do that in some small way, you find that the whole world not doesn't contract to just you, but expands to something well beyond you. Mm -hmm. So you can stand out on the stand out in the cockpit of your sailboat, for example, be surrounded by this incredibly beautiful, beautiful vista, whether it's a sunrise or a sunset, even the even in the stormiest, stormiest days, it's absolutely beautiful. It's beyond almost beyond description. And you can feel one with you have to feel one with that because you're literally embedded in that reality and there's no escaping. It's different if you could look outside your front door, close the door and go back and watch Netflix. Mm -hmm. That's not quite being, you know, fully immersed and engaged in your environment. But you can do that and, it, and, and you can do that literally just stepping outside your front door. You don't have to sail off into the, some wild extremes of the ocean, but like it's bringing that. your whole self to bear on, yeah. on a particular task is what, is what allows you to, to firstly not be um, lonely mm -hmm. because um, we ourselves are very complicated creatures. There's lots to talk to yourself about mm -hmm. if, you, if you were to just take a step back. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we have to acknowledge too, you had an amazing shore crew. Yes. You weren't in touch that often because mm -hmm. of the communication um, mm -hmm. uh, limitations that you had, not mm -hmm. having, but um, you had a, an amazing support team that mm -hmm. helped you through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I want to tell the viewers about, I mean, I'll never say this sentence again in my life. Tell me about your, the food drop outside of Rarotonga. <laughs> Three miles off coast. Yeah, well, that was. Bert, you were starving to death. Yes. You were down to a t tablespoon of rice yeah. and a liter of water. Right. And you're how long away into your trip now? About six months. Yeah, I'm about, I'm about, about six yeah, months. About three months away from yeah. uh, from Victoria. And you can't make. You're not going to. No. Okay. No. So I had. Yeah. Us so what you did. Well, I wasn't <laughs> telling. Uh, the, the shore team consists of my sister. Okay. So she's my sister, uh, um, she's the manager. She's the HR. She's Love PR. It. She's everything. She's absolutely a miracle worker. So mm -hmm. I rely on her whenever I go away and do something crazy. She's, she's the one that holds, literally holds the fort down. So your guardian uh, angel, my guardian angel. So I was lying to her about how much food was oh. left. So, and she knew it. Right. Um, so I, I wasn't truthful about how much food, cause I didn't want them. I didn't want everyone to worry about it because it, it was what I had left. Yeah. I figured if I could finish in Victoria, literally with a tablespoon of rice and a, and a cup of water, that would be good because I figured that would be enough. I had enough food to do that. But my performance, my, my, my mental acuity, my performance, you know, everything was, was degrading mm -hmm. because I wasn't getting enough energy. But I figured I was through the Southern Ocean. I was in the tropics and, you know, into the temperate, lat in, into temperate latitudes, so I'd be fine. So my sister, she said, well, you know, you can stop in Hawaii. And I said, I don't want to stop in Hawaii, you know, to get some people or people would be willing to deliver food. So I don't, want, I don't want that to happen. That's I can make it. That's a whole different version of skip the dishes. Yeah, it's a whole different version <laughs> of Uber Eats. Right? Yeah. So we're gonna, Uber Eats can do it. So 
uh, so she called me up one one night. I got a text or an email saying, "Why don't you go to you know, we can? Why don't you try Rarotonga? It's on your path." I said, oh, it's, "Cook Islands." Yeah, Cook Islands. Yeah. yeah, first visited by Bly, and actually the the, the mutineers went back to and went back to Rarotonga before they ended up in uh, Pitcairn. But anyway, I said, "I don't want to do it. It's yeah. too far out of my way." And she said, well, why don't you just, you know, try? I said, no, no, no. Because my first response was always, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then she kept insisting that I go. So I said, uh, I finally relented and said, okay, I'll, I'll adjust course a little bit and I'll sail within 24 hours of Rarotonga. Mm. She said, good enough. So then she, she at the time, um, it was the height of COVID. Everything was, everything was locked down. New Zealand was literally um, locking everything down in a very, very strict fashion. So she, she pulled every string that you can imagine. It was actually a state secret. It was a state secret between, between you know, us, the shore team, and Rarotonga and New Zealand because they didn't want anyone to know that they had stepped outside sort of the COVID bounds to, you know, to, 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 to accommodate me. Yeah. So we had this whole conversation about how to do it. And, and uh, so when, when I relented, I sort of switched course to Rarotonga. They told me I got too close, I had to sail away again. Really? Uh, yeah, they had to, the, the, the food drop was, they had a dozen different ways. It didn't make any sense to, you know, to drop the food. So when they, when they finally got the go-ahead, they got the go-ahead from the, from the, from the minister, I think, of, of Interior Affairs. It had to be all hush-hush. No one could knew. We couldn't tell anyone. Yeah. And so I sailed within there. And they, they, they came out in a boat, and they literally just threw the food on board. With me, wow. with me hiding at the front with a mask on. I didn't have a mask. I had a scarf on. I had gloves, the whole thing. All, all very strange. So they threw it on board the boat, and I threw it back to them. And they said, why did you do that? Yeah. I said, well, it's a forward pass. Oh. Because they're rugby players, right? And oh, I was a rugby okay. player. So I, I pitched the thing back to them. It's a forward pass. I get it. To, no. so, Your sense of humor. That's what happens through. when you've been alone. By, yeah, you know, you get, a little too long. Yeah, yeah, a little too long. So that's what happened. Bert, did you suffer any injuries or illness during that nine months? I did. I, I got, uh, well, firstly, let me say that I, in order to do these things and come back, mm -hmm. you have to be very conservative. So this all sounds crazy risky, and it is, but when, when you're doing them, you have to be unbelievably uh, conservative. Mm -hmm. So if you injure yourself, it's all over. Full stop, yeah. right? You're, you're done. So um, I was very careful about not getting injured, but as it, which means I'm hanging on all the time, literally. But I, in the Southern Indian Ocean, I, had, I, I was outside in the cockpit hanging on with two hands. And I went to look behind me at the wind vane. And I took one hand off. And I couldn't quite get around. I took the other hand off. And in the instant I took that hand off, I went flying to the back of the boat and bent over backwards over top of the, the, uh, the, uh, the compass oh, pinnacle. Oh, wow. And then I injured my ankle, injured my back. Wow. So I, I lay there for way too long. And then I crawled back into the boat and just all I could do was basically strap myself down. And so uh, wow. I strapped myself down for two days mm. until my back was, uh, until I was able to actually walk around the boat without risking yeah. getting hurt again. Wow. Uh, so I was lucky with the you weather. Very lucky, yeah. Yeah, be but um, because if I hadn't, if I'd been injured more seriously, I would have had to turn around. Exactly. And I yeah. understand you also lost a tooth, one of your front teeth. Yeah. <laughs> so you were a real yeah. pirate out there. Yeah, a bit of a, yeah. yeah. I would yeah. say sea billy bird. Is a, <laughs> there uh, you go. I got tossed into one of the railings and knocked a tooth out. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, we did talk about uh, just celestial navigation. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in our next episode that mm -hmm. we're going to do with you shortly. But uh, just show viewers the, the sextant that okay. you have here. Um, and we'll talk about how you use it in our next episode. Okay. But that's ancient. I mean, that's been used since, yeah, this, uh, I mean, that's what Magellan used, right? Yeah, he used something, he used something like this. Mm -hmm. um, he used something uh, probably called a backstaff. Yeah. So the idea is the same. You measure the altitude of some something like the sun, the moon, mm -hmm. the stars or the planets above the horizon. Can I just hold that for a second? Sure. Wow. So the- Oh yeah, that weighs a fair bit too. Yeah, yeah. that's that one's actually pretty light. That, mm -hmm. that's, that went on the, uh, canoe trip because it's lighter, but, mm -hmm. but it's a it's a very simple principle actually, and the mathematics is actually very simple. It's been well understood for you know quite a long mm -hmm. time. It's very difficult to do at sea because um, you're flopping around you're, all over the yeah, place. Yeah, the motion yeah. is extreme. Exactly. But uh, um, it's a uh, it's 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 ancient, like yeah. you said. The, the, the stars actually are are they all have Arabic names. Hmm. It was the uh, it was the Bedouins you know, trying to get across the Sahara Desert hmm. that gave them names because they used stars to navigate. And, and they, they used a different, the Polynesians, of course, used, used celestial navigation and, and they use it differently or yeah. 
they use a different methodology, but it's been around a long time. Very good. And just have a couple of minutes left. Sure. I just want to uh, tell the viewers too that while you were doing this journey, there was about 2,000 um, elementary school students yeah. who were following your journey yes. and being inspired by you, yes. Bert. That's just wonderful. Yeah. And you're you're going to you're under in the process of uh, writing mm -hmm. three different books. One mm -hmm. is a children's book. Yeah. One about uh, from Salty's one about perspective. Salty. Yeah. Yeah. And about your journey. Yes. So those will be out soon, mm -hmm. and we hope to uh, help you promote those when they're out as well. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting that you were so isolated, so remote that your closest neighbor was actually <laughs> the International yes. Space Station. Yeah. Which yeah. is uh, now that's getting remote. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty remote. Yeah. yeah. The, my my nearest neighbor was two hundred miles that way. So yeah. that's. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Anything that you wish you would have brought that you didn't? More food. Yeah. More food, of more course. more chocolate bars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and any advice to someone who's going to do this? Just one, what's your one snippet of advice if someone wants to do this? Um, Get out the front door. My, my, <laughs> my advice would be to, to just do it. Like there's, there's all kinds of reasons not mm -hmm. to do it, Yeah. but there's only one to do it. And what's that? And that's a simple yes. Mm -hmm. To give yourself permission to say yes, and then the world is literally your oyster. So there's a, uh, um, you can think of a hundred reasons not to do it. The boat is, is too big or too yeah. small. I don't have the right gear, but the, all those are wonderful, wonderful, but uh, just, just go ahead and do it. And you can, it's not, uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm not by any stretch uh, of the imagination, a, you know, a, a sailing celebrity. So. Well, you are now. I may be now, but yeah. <laughs> We'd like to uh, nominate you to the Order of Canada as well, mm -hmm. and we're going to encourage viewers to do that as well, because what you've done is an epic achievement, which mm -hmm. insp inspires a lot of people and encourages other people to get out there as well. We have to wrap this one up, okay. but stay tuned for part two. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Coast Connections, and we look forward to bringing you Bert's next chapter on our episode that's going to follow this very shortly. Thank you. Thank you.